My name is Bronwyn Little Grice and I'm the founder and CEO of And Health. We're Australia's only dedicated digital health accelerator. We act to support and accelerate commercialisation of our high growth potential digital health companies. The report we've released today, And Health, the Sleeping Giant of Australia's Health Technology Industry, is a compilation of data that we've collected over the past two and a half years across the 317 companies we've engaged with in that time. So it's the first granular look at what the sector looks like and the emerging potential within it. And then there's a couple of sections too on, on industry sentiment about how they view their landscape, uh, both pre-COVID done in December 19 and also post-COVID done in May 2020. So it's a really wide ranging report, but it goes into quite a lot of detail about the areas that, in which our digital health companies are focusing, including their clinical indication, their purpose, their intended paying customer, their intended user setting, and their intended end users, as well as exploring more systemic issues such as their financing and the broader perspective on regulation and reimbursement within the sector. Like all health technology companies in Australia, digital health companies have some challenges to commercialising on a global stage. The most significant ones that are picked out by our companies are the lack of access to capital and the lack of grant programs which are specifically aligned to their needs and, and their milestones. And so access to funding is probably our biggest significant challenge in, in preventing this industry from reaching its global potential at this point in time. Alongside that, of course, the commercialisation pathway in digital health is evolving. Uh, so companies need to navigate uh, changing regulations. So there's new regulation coming into Australia in February 2021, but also varying reimbursement pathways. Seeing huge amounts of opportunity coming out of the COVID pandemic, enabling companies to really capitalise on Australia's COVID safe status and our ability to attract inbound interest and investment into our digital health community, including digital health clinical trials, but also development and deployment. So I think it's a really interesting space to be in at this point in time in the in the universe's kind of, in the world we live in today, it's, it's definitely a very interesting space to be in. I think the commercialization challenges we face are ones which we can overcome uh, with access to capital being probably the most profound uh, and given the changes in the equity capital markets in Australia, potentially the one that will take the longest to resolve. But I think at a clinical level and at a product development level and at a agility level, our companies are as good as those that we see anywhere else in the world. I think one thing COVID has taught us is that there are different ways to deliver healthcare. And I think it's broken down a lot of the institutionalised barriers to adoption and mental barriers to adoption for both patients and clinicians with regards to deploying virtual care. And I think it's opened everyone's eyes to the opportunities that sit within digital health as a way of delivering an agile, scalable and economic and affordable healthcare system in the future. So I think it's a really interesting time to be in the space. In terms of shifting clinic from the care from the clinic to the home, it's been known for a long time that a face-to-face -face healthcare delivery system is increasingly unaffordable and that we need to start utilising cutting edge and proven technologies to help people manage their own health and uh, prevent the onset of disease and to engage our patients. It's often said that the greatest blockbuster we can have is the empowered patient. And so these technologies really bridge that gap and I think you can look at companies like ResMed in the way that they've shifted huge numbers of patients into really engaged patients who are being treated in the home. And you can really start to see the potential of these products when patients can use them in their own way and in their own lives without necessarily needing to access a face-to-face -face healthcare provider. It also, in a post-pandemic world, shows us that we can protect our vulnerable patients by providing these technologies so that they don't have to go to high throughput, high personal interaction sites in, in areas of infectious disease or you know, when we have a, an outbreak. So 
clinic to home is really important. I also think in a digital native environment or even for some of us older folks, we are used to having technology to do the things we need to do to live our best lives. And healthcare is a really key part of that. And we see that in the uptake of consumer wellness. And we can look at beyond consumer wellness, say, wouldn't it be great if all of those products had to have clinical data behind the claims that they make and that's what we talk about in regulated digital health and so if we can use an app to improve our outcomes in type 2 diabetes we can use mobile health to improve and digital biomarkers to improve our diagnosis and treatment of mental health we can use technology to ensure people are accessing the right caregiver for them at the right time and we can use technology to identify when people are at risk before they know they're at risk and intervene to prevent an exacerbation. That all points to a scalable and agile and healthcare consumer centric healthcare system that will be much more resilient to future health shocks. So although our data doesn't necessarily go into surveying clinicians themselves it is worth noting that you know over a third of companies are looking at health practitioners being their ultimate end user it's a really interesting space to get into because if we look back at the history of electronic medical records there was initially um, and there's publications on there some resistance by the medical community to patients having access to and control over their own health records and i think we start to see diverging views in the medical community sometimes across generations. So we have a whole cohort of young, digitally native uh, doctors coming through, and then we have people who have built extraordinary medical careers and outcomes on a, on a more traditional framework. So I don't think that the digital demands of clinicians and providers are universal. I think we will see, um, some clinicians will preferentially uptake technology faster than others, as any consumer would. It is really interesting to see, though, that in some cases, and medication adherence is a really good example, that clinicians really do enjoy the ability to get objective data on what the patient does when they're not in the clinic. And that, that can be hugely informative for a clinician that's treating a patient, especially in a chronic condition over a long period of time. But also, I think we can see that clinicians need products that fit their clinical workflow and the clinical guidelines in which they work. So in order to have an ultimate end user that is a clinician, you really need to make sure you understand what how a clinician's life works. And, and specifically in, in the business side of that, we see remote patient monitoring codes in the US really driving this where clinicians are reimbursed to review data from connected devices and digital applications. It's been quite transformative because it takes it from a clinician's doing it because they'd like to do it to a this is part of their reimbursed role to do it. And I think that's a very important step that we need to consider within an Australian context. But I also think that like designing for any consumer or end user position, companies need to really deeply understand those end users. The demands for the clinicians, I think, though, also come back to the demands that we would expect of any genuine digital medicine or digital therapeutic company, which is those products have clinical evidence that they work and that they're safe and that they deliver patient outcomes. Because if we don't have that, then clinicians can't refer people to the product. So again, the regulated framework becomes very important in overcoming clinician resistance to technologies which currently don't need to prove their claims. So I think that that will be a big step in terms of bringing the clinical community on board. There's no doubt in today's world that patients have access to information and the idea that we can prevent them from Googling their own symptoms and conditions before they see a doctor, I think is probably a bit like shutting the stable door after the horse has bolted. So we know that patients will Google their symptoms and condition. We also know that there is a population of worried well. I think where we would benefit is to harness that. So there's, and, and there's a number of factors around this. One is ensuring that our patients are engaged in their own healthcare journey actually delivers greater patient outcomes. Symptom tracking, coaching, all deliver greater patient outcomes. So 
there is no doubt that empowered patients significantly have, have significantly better outcomes than non-empowered patients. We can harness that in so many ways. If we look at the data they generate, the other piece of that is, if we only look at the data that's generated when patients interact with the healthcare system, we only ever get a fragmented picture of that patient's life. If we can get a consumer, an empowered patient or consumer to buy into sharing their data from their smartwatch or their consumer wearables in addition to their health system data, we can start to get a fuller picture. And so those empowered patients, actually the majority of healthcare data and Topol said this, we're looking at a future where the majority of data on a patient actually occurs outside the healthcare system. So the only way of engaging or getting access to that data is to have the patient engaged in the journey. So it's a really important thing to ensure that your, your patient end users or your caregiver end users are really engaged because they are an extraordinary source of data and they have data on themselves that you wouldn't otherwise get. The final aspect is understanding that patients and healthcare consumers are now really used to being able to choose. They choose the type of phone they have, they choose where they go, what they do. We're an incredibly privileged nation in Australia that we have a lot of choice and it is not, it's not a stretch to imagine that people want to choose their doctors. If you are paired with a specialist that you have no real connection with, it's going to be really hard for you to have a deep conversation about your healthcare with that person. So we will see, I believe, patients treating clinic or the clinical community and as service providers and, and seeking to choose and get new referrals if they don't connect with clinicians. And so we can try and prevent consumer choice, but I think that that then drives people into um, almost alternative healthcare systems where you get a really fragment, fragmented approach between consumers who can afford to and those who can't versus having an agile healthcare system that's geared towards patient-centric delivery. So I think the race for digital health is not yet over. Arguably, we're well behind nations such as the US from a reimbursement and regulate, regulatory framework. However, those are hurdles that we can overcome and the pandemic has almost given us a leg up on that because of our COVID safe um, environment that we can now leverage to, to leapfrog ahead. I think with the right investment, we can definitely catch up. And, and the US is the only major country with an advanced reimbursement system for remote patient monitoring, which is creating market pool for digital health technologies that are clinical grade. The key steps to that though, are, you know, regulation so that you can't reimburse a non-regulated product in a medical setting. So that's a, a key part. And I think we are definitely seeing Australia start to move in the right direction. Expansion of conversations beyond my health record and electronic medical records and telehealth and into what else can we deliver digitally to transform the health of all Australians. So I think there's a really, really huge opportunity. And this report demonstrates the pipeline of companies that's there growing, waiting to capitalise on that opportunity. We could really genuinely become a world leading centre of digital health development, commercialisation and deployment. We could attract international digital health clinical trials because we've got a fantastic healthcare system. All the things that made us a leader in pharmaceutical and medical device development, we can now leverage into becoming a, a world leading destination for digital health. So although we might have started a little bit further behind, I in our belief, we really honestly believe that we can be an international destination in this space. One way of looking at the consumer piece is to suggest that it's fragmented. The flip side of that is to look at it and say, look at the diversity of business models that companies are looking to deploy. This is a tricky space in which to create an argument for someone to pay for your technology. Even at the most profound level where a technology makes sense because it's going to save the health system millions of dollars, that doesn't automatically generate a lever or incentive to trigger a payment for that product. 
So although it looks fragmented, we were extremely enthused about that particular piece of data because it shows that people aren't just expecting that government should pay them to do it. They're not just expecting that hospitals should pay. They are really exploring quite diverse business models in order to get to market. And what we do know from digital health is those business models may need to be different in different jurisdictions because the payment landscape is so complex. So I actually got took a lot of hope from the diversity of cust paying customers outlined in the report, from health providers to insurers, to corporates, uh, clinicians, patients, caregivers, pharmaceutical and medical device companies. The, the diversity of those models actually suggests that our companies are being really innovative about finding a sustainable business model in which to go to market. Now those business models may, may evolve as new reimbursement frameworks come into play following COVID or countries put in place incentive programs to try and drive people into virtual clinical care. But the reality is at the moment, they're not just assuming that government should pay them to do it or hospitals should pay them to do it. They are actively looking for diverse customer solutions in order to build sustainable businesses. I don't, I don't think I ever envisage saying this. I think the shining light for us at the moment is probably around the wholesale appetite for reform uh, that we're seeing from the government in terms of an abiding legacy of reimbursed telehealth. Um, and then, you know, an openness to conversations to say, well, wh what else, how else can we deliver that clinical great care beyond the clinic? And I, I do think for the first time we have a government that is genuinely keen in seeing what we can do in that space. And I think that reinvestment piece is probably an area of significant opportunity in the current environment. And as a venture capitalist, it's very weird for me to say that government policy is my shining light <laughs> versus private capital. Because the flip side is if we, if we start to change that reinvestment environment, then the incentive and the business models appear stronger, which generates more interest from a private investment perspective. So you do get a self-fulfilling positive, positive prophecy that starts to come about when you start to create that ecosystem. Five percent of the companies that we've engaged with are led by women or have women in senior leadership roles and I think that that's an extraordinarily great statistic. It's clearly not enough but when you compare it to the rest of the startup community in Australia which averages around 22 percent it is substantially higher and we do see a lot of female founders coming through this program and coming toward to and health for assistance. Part of that might be that we're quite a, a female, we're a female founded and led team so clearly we we try to offer a very safe environment for founders of all backgrounds to come to us. But also I think it shows that in, in digital health, we really see women coming to the fore and in, in understanding how to solve these quite complex and quite human problems. It's an extraordinary time to be a woman in business in Australia. We have come a long way. We still have an extraordinary way to go. We saw this week the AFR publisher pay for about Baker and McKenzie and their brand workshop for women suggesting that women should smile because that's their calling card and and you know it's horrifying to read that type of thing in 2020 because I can't imagine anyone saying to a senior male partner of a law firm that their smile is their business card without getting either insulted or laughed at or dismissed so it's a really important space. How do we improve gender diversity in the space? I think that we really do need to take it on the chin. The problem with equity and achieving equity within a space is that in order for, for women to succeed, there will be a natural rebalancing and less men will be in those positions as more women are in those positions unless, of course, we grow the pie, which we're always trying to do. It's a deeply cultural issue in Australia. I'd love to say I've got a solution. I don't think we do. All we can do, in my mind, is do things like support the Boosting Female Founders Initiative that the Department of Industry, Science and Resources launched. It's a really, it's a really great first step in starting to provide dedicated support to female founders that supports their objectives and, and 
and helps them to overcome some of the systemic barriers. We did a report uh, that after the Boosting Female Founders Initiative was launched that looked at systemic issues in the space and you know, fewer than 20% of accelerators are run by women. Um, fewer than 20% of accelerating commercialization advisors are women. So even if women are successful in establishing companies, they end up in this quite male dominated industry. And we know that investors are predominantly male and there's an issue with diversity investment, although the VC community in Australia is doing a wonderful job at trying to address that. We know that female founders raise less money. These are all known stats. From my mind, we need to look at changing the system, not just changing the outcome for a specific company. So we need to change the system. We need to look at making sure we have gender parity in those advisory roles, in those grant review roles, in investment uh, teams. We need to look at the gender parity around there to remove the systemic biases that are largely often unconscious biases but still exist as companies led by women move through the commercialisation pathway. So throughout COVID, we've seen a significant number of companies come back to us saying they needed to pivot their business model, but also a significant number of companies saying that they saw the ultimate impact of COVID as being positive. One of the most compelling pieces of data from my mind was that 70% of companies said that accessing their customers was more difficult. That's definitely going to have an impact on the companies and how we overcome that will depend on the customers themselves. And, and, and if some of these customers are healthcare providers, then they are clearly very busy just dealing with their current status quo within a pandemic. In terms of looking forward post COVID, there are clearly areas that were, that are likely to grow and that's internationally acknowledged at telehealth, remote patient monitoring, clinical trials, support tools, clinical decision support tools, all identified as areas of potential future growth. Um, also digital diagnostics and symptom trackers. So there's huge opportunities coming out of it. In terms of the sentiment though, I think the majority of the industry is actually positive around COVID. It's, we certainly seem to be all riding a wave of increased awareness about what we're all trying to do and the, and the, the fact that we can deliver serious healthcare digitally. So that's going to be great. Clearly pessimism about access to capital, access to grants that are tailored towards and, and criteria that are set to clearly support digital health companies applying rather than a great example is a lot of our grant programs in medical research are very much focused or heavily weighted on intellectual property. And for digital health, intellectual property may not be the cornerstone part of their strategy. It might be their commercial or clinical evidence. So looking at how we can create grant structures that acknowledge the different pathway and allow access to funds, non-diluted funds for our early stage digital health companies, and then increase looking at how we can facilitate access to capital for later stage companies through either public-private partnerships such as the Biomedical Translation Fund or pure, pure private plays. I personally believe that digital health will be one of the areas of the capital market where investors are probably going to move faster than in other areas coming out of COVID because of the, the impact and the large reform across the world around funding models for this type of technology. In the short term, though, I think we're all up for a little bit of pain and, and access to capital and, and lack of digital health specific funds and access to customers will, will pose problems for companies until the new normal starts to get a bit more of a rhythm around it. One of the things this report shows us is that we have a huge pipeline of high, high potential companies. And that was one of the things we set out to prove when we established Sand Health. A lot of people said we didn't need a dedicated program for this subsector or this sector of the market. And I think this, well, I know that this pipeline really does show that there is clearly an emerging industry here. What we were able to do with our 10 companies in our, first, in our pilot of our flagship program is those companies have now gone on to, to raise over $30 million. They've done over 28 clinical studies They've served 70,000 patients and they've done over 700 commercial pilots. 
They've also added over 165 new employees in high value STEM based roles. So these are, these are companies that have proven that with the right support, they can be significant drivers of growth and um, economic potential. What, we, what we've been working on is how we, if we were to fund that program for five years at scale, what do we think we could achieve? So our projections based on our prior outcomes say that if we were funded to run 50 companies through that program over five years, so 10 companies a year, that we could create at the end of year five over a thousand jobs in digital health and over 200 clinical trials. And that to me is an industry that is poised for significant growth and has enormous potential if given the right support. And importantly, those companies would then serve over 500,000 patients. So they will impact, they're health system ready when they come out of our, our programs and they can impact patients and change lives when they come out of that program. So looking forward, I am enormously optimistic about what we can do in this sector. The areas we need, we need to support our companies in are around uh, business acumen and financial acumen and navigating global markets and navigating complex payment systems and securing those business models and supporting their clinical trials and their commercial pilots and supporting how they go to scale globally from Australia and build those businesses here in Australia. And in a post-pandemic world, we have an enormous opportunity to do that and to build our companies here in Australia and have them service in global markets because there is no travel. So it's a, it's a great opportunity. I'm super excited. I can't wait to meet with the other 300 companies that are probably out there that we haven't met with yet and look forward to working with all of these amazing founders as they go forward and try to change lives.